You're listening to Trek FM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field and we'll look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan and you're listening to the 602 Club. Hello and welcome to the 602 Club coming at you from the, well, the just the gorgeous sights that are Naboo. And I am just one of your hosts here, Matthew Rushing. Christy Morris is not here with me this week, but I have a great friend from the Ion Cannon podcast here to talk about something really special. And I am just so excited to have back William Devereaux. Hello, brothers. Mr. Back. Oh, sorry. That's I thought right. we were on Naboo. That's right. I know, I know. We had to do it. We had to do it. And, you know, uh, he makes an appearance in, in what we're going to talk about. So, <laughs> Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Glad yeah. to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, this is great. I, and it's uh, it's fun because, um, you know, we go way back now because of Star Wars. I mean, we're, yeah. we're friends be- and we met because of Star Wars, which is just so cool. It is. It is. It's Star Wars really brings people together. And it, it's great how we've been able to continue that that friendship and talk star wars uh on podcasts and off uh for so many years now yeah i mean we have a group of friends that we have legitimately i think been talking together pretty much every day we say something to each other in our group chat called the twi'lex of the night which is just a fantastic name (laughs) yeah anyway um but i mean for like four and a half years almost five years now yeah it's going on a while Wow, it's hard to believe. Yeah, I know, so crazy. Well, thank you, Dragon Con, for bringing us all together. We really appreciate it. Um, but uh, this week we're going to talk about Queen's Peril, which has just been released, and we're super excited to get into this uh, new Star Wars book with you. Uh, before we do that, though, just want to say a huge thank you to uh, everyone who's listening. Um, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please do hit us up with a star rating review. Let other people know what you think of the show and help uh, help them find the show. Uh, we're on Twitter at Trek FM. We're on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Trek FM. We've got the listeners only discussion group on Facebook as well. That's called the Babel Conference, and you can be let into that. And you can talk about uh, anything that we're doing here on Trek FM with fans from and listeners from all over the world. We've also got um, Trek.FM, which is our website. And if you go to the contact section, you can send Christy and I an email through that. And then last but not least, I want to say a huge thank you to our social producers here through the show. Uh, Ken Tripp, Davis Grayson, Ryan Millett, and Daniel Noah. Uh, they support us through Patreon to make sure that everything that comes out on the 602 Club, as well as the entire network, keep coming to you each and every week. And so uh, you can go to patreon.com uh, slash... Trek FM and see how you can become part of our team. We've got some great contribution levels, but uh, every little bit helps. So again, go to patreon.com slash Trek FM. So William, uh, we have had one book already about Amidala, and that was called Queen Shadow. And that book really focused on uh, Padme as a senator. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, kind of in between that time, uh, between The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. This book goes back to her beginning as queen. She just gets elected, uh, and then it's her, you know, first few months uh, as queen, I guess even maybe first almost year possibly uh, as queen, as she's really trying to find her footing. And, um, you know, I thought it was interesting that we, we kind of, have this story about the new queen now instead of then. And so uh, to me, that was real shock, actually, that this was going to be almost like going back in time. Yeah, it, it's kind of a, a prequel to a prequel in, in some ways. You know, I think Queen's Queen's shadow was interesting because you got to understand a little bit more about how Padme was dealing with the transition from being a, a queen to being a senator. And they're in their very different roles and kind of how she uh, uh, and a little more about her relationship with her handmaidens and all that kind of stuff. But Queen's Peril takes us back to, I think, I think Queen Shadow started at right at when she was the, during the election of the new queen, if I remember correctly. Um, but this actually takes us back to 
uh, to when she actually becomes elected at the age of 14 uh, as the queen. She, she, she assumes the, uh, the, takes on the crown and kind of has to, how she deals with becoming a queen, uh, setting up her, um, her whole uh, uh, court, I guess, you know, uh, and all of her handmaidens, all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, it is interesting for all of us who've always wondered kind of what was going through her head and what went down. Um, it's an in- interesting backstory. Yeah, because this, this, both books are about a transition in her life. One is from, you know, being a uh, candidate for queenship, which is mm-hmm. kind of strange that they elect queens. But anyway, that's, that's but neither here nor there. <laughs> yes. um, so that, you know, you, she's, she's transitioning from basically being a citizen to being queen. Yeah. And then the next book is about the transition from being queen to senator. And so I thought that was that, I mean, it's a, interesting thing to actually give us a chance to look at and part of that you know this idea of the new queen is that i thought it was really interesting that we get a little picture of her parents and how you know her mother is actually really happy for her and although her father is very proud that she's becoming queen you know, he never necessarily wanted politics for his daughter. Mm-hmm. But the reason that she's kind of gone into politics is actually kind of his fault because he's always been a person who's been so much about helping people, um, even being somebody who's gone on relief missions and taken mm-hmm. Padme with him as she's been younger. And so really who she is kind of comes from these two people. And I thought one of the, the pluses of the book here was really the fact that in the short scenes that you have her parents, that uh, Johnson really does a great job of helping you see why Padme is the way she is from her parents. Totally. I love that aspect. And it was also really... Um, again, fascinating to see how little communication she could have with her parents uh, as well. There are all sorts of rules in place around how much she could, could or could not contact them. Uh, I think during the, the uh, election, they, they obviously had to like, they don't know Padme's real identity in the, in the movie, right? We, we never really think about how you, we see, watch the Phantom Menace and you see Queen Amidala and later it's revealed that she's Padme. And then in the later movies, they just refer to her as Padme all the time. And we never really think about how, of course it's her real name growing up and, when she was elected queen, she kind of had to hide her true identity. It's not like, you know, here in the United States where, you know, when you're, you're campaigning, be like the president or some other elected office, everyone knows you, they know your backstory. She's like trying to basically has to hide her backstory, hide who she is and just purely go on her platform. And it's an interesting thing. I don't think we ever really, at least I never really considered um, as a, that would be the case as a result of, that big twist and that big secrecy. Right. Cause Amadala is her made up name basically right. so that nobody knows who, you know, her family is, um, you know, so it allows them to have an- anonymity once mm-hmm. they retire from being queen. Right. Uh, so that they can kind of go back to some kind of normalcy, which is again, like you said, completely different from, you know, say any of our presidents that are still alive where, you know, everybody knows who Bill Clinton and George W. Bush are. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And even, even like other other countries or, or whatever, where they take on like maybe a different name. Uh, it's always like you still know their backstory. And it's it's a very right. interesting concept, uh, you know, to, to kind of dive into a bit more. And it, it makes it harder for Padme because she can't contact her parents as much either. Uh, I th- I'm trying to remember now, I, you know, like she was talking about how she couldn't. I think it was during. Do you remember it was during the. Was it during the campaign or or after she was queen like she wasn't allowed to talk to them at all for a while right after yeah it's it's interesting because right after the campaign she is able to uh right after she gets elected she's able to call them yeah um but there and she has a specific secure line that allows her to be able to contact her parents yeah but it's not like it's something that she can do every you know, all the time right, right. because it's, it's, it's a specific line that can only be reached. I think, you know, uh, you know, from a specific place, you know, so yeah. it's not like she gets to keep in constant contact with them. Yeah. It's just very, very interesting, especially for like a, a you know, we have to remember that she's 14 in, right in the book, you know, and it, again, it, you know, we, it's things we've known, like, you know, Naboo elects young monarchs. Matt Padme is the youngest, but you know, they tend to elect younger monarchs and, and, you know, and they have to like hide their whole 
history from the public. It's just a, again, a fascinating concept. Well, and that that's it, you know that's a great transition because you know uh, part of this book, uh, especially right at the beginning, is all about a new security team, mm-hmm. and you know Panaka is kind of paranoid, <laughs> and so he's the one who actually comes up with this idea, and and it's an idea that's been used before, but it's been a while since somebody's really uh, instituted it, and he comes up with the idea as the handmaiden, as the decoy when necessary. And it's Padme who really comes up with the idea of having more than one so that nobody would be able to suspect the difference ever. Mm-hmm. And so they kind of would be interchangeable and, and do even a better job, basically, of doing what Panaka suggests. Yeah. And so this is where we get not only the chance to recruit all of the handmaidens uh, and and learn about them. Um, but this is really, this part of the book really deals with them kind of learning their roles and how they're going to work together and how they're actually going to work this. Because again, nobody's tried this in quite some time and especially with this amount of handmaidens. Mm-hmm. So to me, again, that was something that was, was really interesting because, yeah. it, you know, we think of this as just being part and parcel for what it means to be a Naboo queen and or king. And yet that's not, the case like this is Mm -hmm. something that what we're learning is that it's been a long time that since anybody's really used handmaidens in this way yeah that's again uh like you i found that to be one of the most fascinating and and interesting aspects of the book is just getting to understand how the handmaidens work and their and their roles and the fact that you know it wasn't something that every single queen king and queen of naboo has had going back you know generations it's it's a, it's kind of a new, new and unique thing, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Again, that you know, when you think back on it, and you really start to think think critically about it. Of course, they couldn't have it where, you know, every time one of the handmaidens is actually the, you know, like you never really know is one of the handmaidens actually a decoy. If it was a public, uh, you know, a common it's thing, what's a decoy, right? <laughs> if it was a common thing, like uh, the 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 decoy, actually, the ruse wouldn't work. Um, and so if you think about it critically, you know, then of course you have to arrive at that conclusion. Um, but uh, it's something that again, hadn't really thought about and is a really neat aspect and shows kind of Panaka and Padme's foresight in some ways. Now, uh, on the flip side, it almost seemed a little too convenient that Panaka was like, Oh, I'm really worried about this. And then next thing you know, like the planet's invaded and they actually need it. But again, Makes sense. Uh, I liked it, and I really liked getting to understand the the handmaidens and their roles a bit more. Personally, like I've always like, uh, you know, there's a couple handmaidens, you know, and the rest I can't keep their names straight. Uh, it's hard to keep their faces straight. And one of the probably my favorite moment in the book. So basically, they're doing your job, is what you're saying. Yes, and 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 that's my favorite moment in the book was how was when they actually picked names that were similar to Padme's. So that no one would be able to keep their names straight, and I'm like, oh, that, that's that's so perfect because that, that's exactly what what happens. You know, I can never remember their names. That's why they're you know, slippy, Padme slinky, and swappy, and slippy, and- Samsonite. I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I, I really like that aspect, and I like to get an understand a bit more about like what do they all do for Padme? You see all these handmaidens walking around. What's their purpose? What's their what's their job? Um, do they just like sit there and nod and follow her around everywhere? No, they, they actually do have individual pur- purposes. Um, it's really interesting, you know? Yeah, I think, uh, it, you know, one of the things the book does too, and this has been really popular in the Disney uh, lit, which is interludes, and mm-hmm. we have these little interludes of Panaka approaching the, the different girls he thinks would be good as handmaidens and kind of getting an understanding of where they come from. So that that's definitely pretty interesting. Uh, it gives us a little bit, like you said, more of their backstory that leads into the things that they end up doing for Padme, whether it's, you know, they're the ones who are basically the costumer, you know, that helps come up with uh, the way that her dresses function and her headpieces function and all those kind of things uh you know the one who's really good at tech mm-hmm. the, obviously uh sabe is is the the most recognizable she's played by karen knightley in the film and you know she's the one who 
really ends up doubling Padme the most because she's the one that looks the most like Padme and and then the most similar in the sense of like the way they can do the voice and everything like that. And so really this whole section of the book is them kind of coming up with how this is going to work. And in many ways it's, you know, it's their origin story mm-hmm. for, you know, it, it, it it's just like, you know, when you're reading a Batman comic and it's the first story of how Batman becomes Batman, you know, and like him finding the voice and like uh, that kind of stuff, like all of those things that we see in the film are specific choices. So, you know, people have always kind of made fun of the fact that, you know, Natalie Portman seems to be so aloof and everything and her voice seems to be so kind mm-hmm. of like monotone and that. They've worked that into the story that it's on purpose so that they can interchange and people won't notice because there isn't a lot of nuance to be picking up on between them. That's another great, great little uh, call out about the book is that, you know, again, the, the, the movements, the, the voice they designed, they designed Queen Amidala's entire persona around something that they could all mimic and, and, and play a, a part of. Um, which is really neat, and and even the fact that uh, Panaka him, uh, himself didn't know about the decoy, uh, they did the plan. They didn't even tell Panaka, and they like tried to pull it on him. And eventually, you know, he's he's smart enough; he figures it out. Um, but you know, they they didn't even keep the head of security in the loop about what they were really doing. Yeah, and that's something that you know kind of becomes a <laughs> frustration for Panaka yeah. is that these girls are kind of doing things without kind of keeping him fully in the loop. But in some ways they think to themselves that this is really part of the reason, you know, for that, uh, mm-hmm. it, it, the, the reason for having these handmaidens is, is one of the, mm-hmm. the ways to keep her safe in the utmost. And so, you know, that, that is really fascinating. And I, I think this is one of the parts of the book. Again, I think the beginning of this book is really strong in all of these areas because it's really accentuating all of these things that we haven't known about. And it, and it, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think on top of that, you know, we had a new queen, a new security team, and now we kind of have a new direction because Naboo's previous queen was a bit of an isolationist. Mm-hmm. And I would say a bit of a jingoist. <laughs> Uh, and created some problems for Naboo, uh, who now is in need of help from the the other planets in their system because they've had a bad harvest. And so one of the things that Johnson does in the book is that she kind of ties this idea of trade, the isolationism of Naboo that they're trying to come out of because of Padme, and their actual need for help, she ties all that into the idea of what Palpatine is doing as Sidious with his trade disputes that he's <laughs> stoking the fires of and secretly pushing as Padme herself is actually trying to chart a brand new course for Naboo and make them more friendly to the other planets in their system and actually make them somebody that other planets might you know, look to and want to trade. And so I thought this was really a great part of the book because, again, as you mentioned earlier, this kind of being a prequel to a prequel, this really seems to be setting the stage then for the why of all of these trade disputes, Mm -hmm. the the reason, you know, Naboo is chosen. I mean, and it's not just Sidious, although he seems to have a lot to do with all of this, but there's been other things that have been kind of... uh, putting Naboo maybe in a bad light, you know, in its own mm-hmm. system. Um, and so that, all of that stuff I thought was really strong. Totally, totally agree. I, I loved how it tied into Phantom Menace. And actually I was surprised that they, they went as far into the Phantom Menace as they did. I expected it to be a pure prequel and it, it runs all the way through the end of the Phantom Menace. Uh, and we get to see the movie from a different point of view. In some ways, in some cases, in other cases, it's the you know same point of view, um, and we get to kind of find out a little more of what's happening on on Naboo during the time. And, and I, again, I liked how they all of that stuff was weaved in, and it kind of made the plot like the why why was Naboo so susceptible? It wasn't just that they were, you know, like they, yeah, sure they were blocking their resources, but we actually find out that they had they didn't have enough food anyway, and the their stores were low, and so that's why the blockade was extra painful for them well and yeah because two one of the things that padme does is that to chart this new course for naboo 
she holds a conference mm-hmm. for the planets in her system to kind of bring the heads of state there to begin opening up a dialogue, you know, to begin having these conversations and, and basically to st- try and create a more f- uh, friendly environment for Naboo with these other planets. But um, basically, in, in, in many ways, opening Naboo back up mm-hmm. uh, and, and helping uh, people see that, you know, they're not the stick in the muds that they've kind of made themselves a- out to be, you know, over the, the reign of the previous queen um, and that they don't think of themselves as better than others, which, again, that kind of ties into what we hear, you know, the Gungans say about uh, the Nabubians or the Nubies or the newbies. Uh, we'll call them the newbies. Um, so, you know, I just think that's really interesting as well. So you're creating this conference that allows her to be able to truly bring Naboo in a new direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's again, all of that stuff. I, I, it was fascinating just to see more of like, what was Padme's agenda as queen? What was she trying to do? What was, how was she trying to, um, you know, move Naboo forward? A lot of that stuff we didn't necessarily know beforehand. And I really appreciated getting that kind of behind the scenes. And, and I totally agree. I think that's where the, the first half of the book is, strongest that's why the first half of the book is strongest um i i I did find that probably the biggest well some maybe the biggest uh, occasionally it seemed like the the handmaidens especially were maybe a little too smart uh for being you know 14 or younger now again like padme is a a girl who's 14 and was elected queen so she's got to have some level of, of intelligence uh there more than your average 14 year old and i know the the uh, people in the boot, you know, elect younger queens. But I think that was the one thing that, like, I felt like the handmaidens were maybe a little too smart for their age at times. Uh, but again, it's been a long time since I was 14 or let alone, and never, never been a 14 year old girl. So who knows? I can't speak for it. <laughs> well, so uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, so there's, it's at this section of the book that I, uh, I, I'll admit, I feel like the book begins to go off the rails. Mm hmm. Uh, because we get these great scenes of them having this conference and everything, and then Sabe begins to kind of have a relationship and a flirtation with one of the leaders from one of the other planets. And it creates this, um, this whole scenario where the handmaidens decide to sneak out of the castle... Mm. Padme included, except for one of them who's sick, uh, and go with Sabe and her friend to a concert. And it's at this moment, like, I I get we're trying to make them feel like real people and that they are 14-year-old girls. But I also felt like this was a moment where we kind of showed maybe the ludicrousy of having a 14 year old as the head of your planet, because, you know, as we see in the Phantom Menace, Padme is really smart. She's yeah. commanding. She's the one who comes up with the plan to help save her planet all by herself. Like she seems to be very capable. She seems much older than her years. Mm-hmm. And I felt like this really, actually hurt that because you were talking about they come off as smarter than in most their cases they're coming 14 with plans you're like wow right that's, for like being 14 you know like that's a pretty smart plan uh right. and sometimes it felt too smart for their own for their age yes again knowing that the people in the Nabu, Nabu tend to be you know like uh, you know have these big roles at a younger age so i can i can you know suspend disbelief for that type of thing and we see padme being incredibly smart uh, in in the movies, so it's like you know, obviously, just her makes total sense. Is it everyone a little harder to believe? But that's fine. Um, but but then there's these moments where it's like very clearly, you know, there's like some some moments where they're very clearly making like really unwise decisions. Um, that it, it kind of I don't know. It, it's almost like it, it swings wildly between either like way too smart for their own good or way too. Um, uh, Maybe not thinking with their their heads for their own good. Yeah, <laughs> which again, yeah, I mean, it it's just due, it smells but... like team spirit. 
yeah. it just smells like teen spirit <laughs> you know um that that's really the problem here is that like you said like we swing so f- the pendulum goes from them being geniuses to being like full on as teenage girl as you can get and so I, I think that's really kind of where my problems really start with the book and I will say that I, I don't think the book ever finds its footing after that um, and I want to talk about that in a minute but before we do that and get to that section. I did. I thought that them setting the stage for the milieu of the galaxy right before the Phantom Menace was really strong because mm-hmm. not only does Johnson add what's going on in Naboo, but she gives you some scenes with what uh, Sidious uh, and Palpatine are doing, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that duality and the way they're using the Senate and the way they're using the Trade Federation. I thought that was really fascinating. I love that she even touched on qui-gon's awareness and having like obi-wan read like senate transcripts about these trade disputes because he senses something's going on i thought that stuff was really strong and so as a prequel to a prequel i thought that this she was doing a really good job totally yeah i think i i i I, I'm I kind of have two minds about those brief chapters from the different point of view of some of the other characters. Cause I love, I love seeing them as a fan. And I think they, they add to uh, the, you know, the, the Phantom Menace. You know, we get to see uh, point of views of you know, Obi-Wan and Maul and Jar Jar Binks and Anakin and Sidious, right? All these like, and they're very brief chapters in between every couple, every couple chapters or so we'll get a very brief, um, you know, a couple pages from them uh, or a couple paragraphs. And I thought that was interesting, but on the same by the same token, they kind of came out of nowhere. Like, this is really Padme's story, and then all of a sudden we're like, oh, with this other famous character, and then that's it. We never see him again. And so I don't know, like as a as a prequel to the Phantom Menace, I, I think it does a decent job. I think um, a book like Plagueis probably did better in, in that respect, and that it's able to like weave together. You know, oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, uh, the different, the, what else is going on in the galaxy? But as a, this is what is happening on Naboo uh, mm-hmm. for a book that's specifically talking about Naboo. I thought it would did it did well. Um, and again, I love the, the point of views of the different characters. It just seemed like it kind of was like very random, just thrown here because you know who they are and you're going to be excited and it's mm-hmm. interesting. Um, it's an interesting backstory, but I, I I almost wonder like. Is it the right story to put those in? I don't know. Yeah, that's a. I think that's a really good point. Um, I honestly completely agree with you. I I think as much as I kind of enjoyed it, I also felt like it it does seem to take away from the focus of the book, which should be just Padme, mm-hmm. and you know, and what's I think going on with her as becoming queen, like right, and her transition into really becoming the queen that we would see. In the Phantom Menace, and so from you mentioned earlier, I thought it was so smart. You said it. We see the Phantom Menace from a different point of view, uh, and this is the biggest problem I have with this book: is that it goes through the Phantom Menace, but through the perspective of the handmaidens. Uh, so we'll see those that were left on Naboo, mm-hmm. those that are with Padme, and the problem is, is that it doesn't really add very much to the story of the Phantom Menace for the most part. And also, again, it feels divorced in some ways from the mm-hmm. beginning of the book, which is so coherent and cohesive with its its setup of, of, of trying to figure out Padme and these handmaidens and everything. And this is the biggest mistake of the book is that I think it feels like the tale of two halves. Yeah. The first half of the book is this great story of Padme trying to chart her course for Naboo what the Naboo is going to be under her leadership. And the second half of the book just feels like something that we've already seen before with maybe a few interesting tidbits here and there, but it feels completely unnecessary. And so I would say two things, either the whole book needed to be about this conference and Padme trying to reassert Naboo's, you know, presence in the system, or uh, it just needed to be a short story. But to go all the way through the Phantom Menace actually hurts the rest of the story because not only that, but the section about the Phantom Menace is so 
chopped up because it's basically just little snippets. Yeah. It falls into the trap of the previous book where it just feels like vignettes. Yeah. It and feels it's like, not good. If it, honestly, to me, it felt like a rushed novelization of the, of the Phantom Menace. Yes. Just thank at, you. If you were just to look at the scenes from one character's point of view, and if they yes. weren't in that scene, they don't, doesn't show up. And so you don't really get the whole story. You just get Padme's point of view during the Phantom Menace. And on the one hand, again, it's, it is interesting because, you know, you know, you get to see what's happening on the planet while everything else is going on. Okay, you know, interesting, but it, it felt too. I mean, is like it that said, interesting it was, though? I think I, I really want to ask that. Do do you find it that interesting? Um, on the scale of interesting, it's fairly low. It's like, oh, now I know what happened on the planet. You know, it's like I guess it's like it's more checking the checkbox than wow, mm, that's such a cool. Good. Uh, uh, that's such a cool revelation or something. Um, you know, I, I, I guess my problem with it, as you said, was it, very, it felt very, it did feel very rushed and it, like it wasn't the complete story. I suspect that they felt they needed to tell the fan story of the Phantom Menace in order to um, complete the story arc of the Handmaidens and the Disguise, right? Because you can't, they didn't, I don't think they wanted to set up the de- whole decoy mm-hmm. thing and then not really pay it off. Right. Uh, and see, later. that's, yes. No, I agree with you. Yeah. I think that's exactly why to do it. But I also think that it, and I kind of hate to say this, so, but I think it's the lazy way to do it. I think what you do is you make the story of the conference, again, much bigger. Mm-hmm. And you make that be the place where you really have to learn this. So then... It's not that the Phantom Menace is the first time they're really trying to pull all this off. It's actually that they had been able to do this beforehand. So it explains why they're able to do it so well in the Phantom Menace. Because obviously in the Phantom Menace, they seem to pull it off like they've been doing it for years. Right. And 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 I did like how at the conference they did, you know, we got to see a little mm -hmm. bit of that and that, that, that tension of like, oh my gosh, can they, you know, in the Phantom Menace, we don't know that she's... A decoy until it's revealed near the end of the movie um, right but in this we actually know that, that there's a decoy and there's a swap happening we get to see the behind the scenes of like how they quickly manage the swap you know there's the tension of like can they make it back to the room in time so that you know they're, they're, the plan isn't spoiled like that part was cool um and i you're totally right like i feel like they if they'd spent more time on that and kind of set up how it goes into the Phantom Menace, I feel like it would have been a stronger book overall. Yeah. I mean, and, and legitimately, the, that last, the last half of the book really is just kind of this retelling of the Phantom Menace, which, again, you're not adding enough for me to really care about reliving the Phantom Menace other than me just going to rewatch the movie. Or just, I might as well read the novelization of it, you know? Like, uh, yeah. I don't think that you're really doing yourself a service. And the problem was is that I felt like the first half of the book was pretty strong. It goes off the rails in, you know, halfway through the conference. And then it never finds itself again because it's too worried about tying into the Phantom Menace. But then again, like, legitimately... It's just these quick vignettes. I mean, there will even be this like one sentence of like Anakin saying, Anakin thinking to himself, I really like flying. I really, really like flying. And it's just like, yeah, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Uh, and part of that is that the, the Phantom Menace itself does such a better job of telling most of this story, obviously, because it's the movie. Right. Um, right. And I, I think again, um, I didn't feel like the promise of the the beginning of the book really paid off through the Phantom Menace in the way that I wanted, mm-hmm. because it, it it again it just feels so quick and chopped up and 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 that just frustrated me, because I thought that the setup at the beginning was pretty strong. In fact, we were talking about it. Yeah. And I, was, I was reading and I was like about a third of the book uh, in, and I was like, man, this is way better than the first book, and. In many ways, I would say this is better than the first book in some uh, in many senses. Mm-hmm. But that last, literally half of the book, it was just like, mm, well, at least the first half was better. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of it, it's it's interesting because they 
they rely on you knowing the, the yep. Phantom Menace, which again, I would hope most Star Wars fans probably know, but you know, you know, you never know. They do rely on you knowing the Phantom Menace, but then they also make sure they kind of retell the Phantom Menace in order to bring that story full circle. And it, it does end up just feeling like, you know, you're just kind of reading through it to get to the end versus the first half. You're like, oh, this is really interesting, really fascinating. I love seeing how Padme and Panaka are forming the 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 team and how the handmaids work and how they're setting things up. I thought that was so much more compelling just because it was a yes, a new story told in a really compelling way. Um so, you know, it's from that standpoint it was uh uh it, it's kind of too bad. Uh, we do get again to see like some of the other characters that were in Queen's Shadow, like uh, Merrick Panaka and Tanra, who we never actually see in the movie, but were in Queen's Shadow, and so they they try to like work in those characters and say, "Oh no, see, they wish they still were here during the Phantom Menace and and that sort of thing." Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it. Um, I, I guess it, it kind of comes down to, and I'm, I'm wondering what you think. Uh, what what would you rate Queen's Peril? Oh, that's that's tough. Um, I almost feel like it's like it, it's too bad because the first again the first half was so good. The second half was just eh. It was I wouldn't say it was bad. It was just not great. And unfortunately, that means it doesn't really deliver on the setup in the first half of the book. But I really enjoyed the first the first half. I don't know. I. Maybe like six and a half out of ten or something. I don't know. Like it was decent. It was an enjoyable story. Um, it's not something I would probably go back to and, and read again. I, I again, I liked learning more about the the handmaidens' roles. I feel like I actually understand who the handmaidens are now. Even after Queen's Shadow, I really didn't feel like I had a good sense of the the handmaidens as opposed to in, here in Queen's in Queen's Peril. Um, and kind of more what they were doing and why they were doing it. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, also, I'm um, team Panaka for sure. Not, not team Typho. Like, come on. Panaka's way better than Captain Typho. Well, I don't know. Cause, uh, Panaka becomes the Imperial overlord of Naboo. Once yeah, which is the takes over. most annoying so. thing. Panaka would never do that. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> apparently he likes being in power. Uh, so, <laughs> I you know I was we're very pretty disappointed close when I when I read that. <laughs> Not in the script, you know. Thank you so much. Aftermath. Come uh, on, Panaka. Really, geez. Imperial Governor Moth. Oh. Turd. Uh, anyway, okay. So <laughs> I'm I'm actually very close to where you are, and I think you said it the best. Uh, you know, the first half of the book is good, and the second half is just not great. And so to me, that equals it's a five out of ten. Like. It really is legitimately half a good book. And then the other half just is. And so I come to, again, this this either needed to just be a short story novella or like an ebook, Or somebody needed to come in as an editor and be like, you know what? Let's not go through The Phantom Menace and let's just make The Crane's Peril something that we didn't know about before. Uh, you know, and I, I think that's a much better idea and it makes for a much stronger story. Uh, and you can still do all the sage setting for the Phantom Menace like that was being done. Without explicitly saying it. it without explicitly yeah. getting, I, I, I'll just be honest, boring midway through the book where, you know, you're just reliving things that you already know. So, and from a slightly different point of view, but not a point of view that truly is making me interested to continue to read. So, um, yeah. you know, it, it's it's okay. Um, not all Star Wars books are going to be winners. And, you know, this just this one didn't sit well with me. But I'm really interested to see what other people think. So hit us up, uh, you know, on social media uh, or over on the Babel Conference. Let us know what you think. Um, and William, it's it was so much fun, though, to be able to, to talk with you about another Star Wars thing, because that's, I mean, you, 
I was thinking about this last year. Last year, I came up and, and hung out at your place, and mm-hmm. I think we sat at this burger joint for like three hours right, just talking that. about Star Wars <laughs> uh, as we ate burgers and drank beer. It was great. But, um, I remember that. If that was, anybody that was wants, a lot of fun. It's so good. So um, hopefully we'll get to do that again soon. Um, but if anybody wants to check out what uh, you've got going on or find you online, where can they find you? Yeah, so I'm on uh, on Twitter uh, at uh, Master Devwi, M A S T E R D E V W I, um, and uh, as I think you mentioned at the top of the show, uh, I do a podcast uh, called Ion Cannon. You can find us at IonCannonCast dot com and the Star Wars Report dot com, and uh, we review every episode of. Uh, the Star Wars television shows, um, the movies, many of the books, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's hard to keep keep up with everything, but uh, we we primarily focus on the the, to the television shows. Uh, right now, we're going through our reviews of uh, the Clone Wars season seven. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm loving what we're getting. It's it's clo- It's gonna it's gonna close out strong. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just so everybody knows, as we're recording this, um, we're actually recording this a little early. Uh, and so the Clone Wars is not finished. So as we talk about this, don't, don't, don't kick us because we, we don't actually know how it ends yet because we're recording this in the past, but we you're going to get the episode in the future. So, but yeah, but, but, uh, but you, you know, you were actually on our podcast as well, just a yeah, couple of so much fun, ago actually. talking about uh, deal or no deal. So and that was a lot of fun to have you on as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox, Vero, under the name Matt Rushing Zero uh, Two. You can also find me uh, here on the network doing the Orb with Chris Jones talking about Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. I'm over on the Nerd Party Network doing two shows. One is called Owl Post with Trey Kaufman, as we're talking about Harry Potter each and every week, one chapter at a time. Doing aggressive negotiations, which is a Star Wars podcast. We're doing that with John Mills, and every week we're talking about a new Star Wars topic. It's a lot of fun, so I hope you'll check that out. And then, last but not least, doing cinema stories. My good friend Courtney, as we talk about films, to the ones of faith. But we want to say thank you so much for joining us, and may the Force be with you. Thank <laughs> you.